Hey everyone, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. You're here with Rick and Eric. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Eric. How are you, my friend? I am good. I already had my protein shake and then I was really bad and had a croissant. Oh, well, you know, when I, uh, I can have protein in the morning, but if I have something uh, starchy or croissant or toast or something, my oatmeal even, I go right to sleep. So uh, I have to be, be careful what I take in in the mornings. The carb crash. Hey everyone, this is your, it's your first time here. Garden Fork is this eclectic mix of DIY and homesteady gardeny stuff. And you got Rick and Eric, and it's going to be really eclectic today. So, talking got a lot of, of topics. Talking of protein shakes, um, I made a. Vi- I've actually been starting to have protein shakes in the morning instead of the oatmeal, and uh, with an eye toward losing some weight. And I made a video about the protein shake I make. It's very simple. And then I wondered whether it was an appropriate garden fork video or not a protein shake what do you think i think so i mean it's food and we do a lot of food things here and uh this time of year um this is the easiest time for me to lose weight um we eat lots of uh uh, garden salads you know straight out of our garden and uh, don't eat much meat don't eat much uh, uh fattening stuff have kind of moved to the um to the mediterranean diet yeah we eat a lot yeah we eat a lot of salmon um a lot of fresh vegetables, uh, olive oil, and uh, just a little bit of um, of uh, yogurt. In fact, I've started making my own yogurt again. So, um, you know, we that's pretty much how we eat uh, all uh, all summer long. It's harder during the winter, though. I actually made a video about the uh, Instant Pot pressure cooker, and you can make yogurt in the Instant Pot pressure cooker. Really? Yeah, I'm going to make – I will make a video about that. But okay. anyway um, – so yeah, protein shake video. Okay, I will post it. So it was yeah. fun. The, the camera operator helped out. So yeah, I owe you a couple of uh, videos. Uh, one, I was going to do this uh, new kind, or not a new kind, but a uh, kind of hydroponics that doesn't use a pump, uh-huh. and it uses one of those uh, slide under the bed um, uh, container things that uh, has little wheels on it. Yep. And I was getting ready to put it all together, and I backed out over it in my truck. <laughs> <laughs> Oops! <laughs> and I need to go get another one. So uh, I owe you that one. Um, I think I owe you one on making um, uh, salad dressing, which is really easy to do. Just you know, homemade salad dressing. Yeah, and the stuff I out did, of the jar is yeah, tastes like glue. Yeah, and I shot a one. It has a lot of bad stuff in it, lots of sugar, even though it doesn't taste like it. Um, and then I shot just a very quick little video on a, a, a clothes dryer modification, um, a venting problem we had and how i solved it and we'll touch on that later in the show okay yeah. what's up first who's on first well I, a while ago um i st- had a solo podcast about it's okay to suck at something and i totally suck at beekeeping and um this is a beekeeping story but it's kind of have a bigger story arc that applies to being in the moment and doing the wrong things so uh, i've been there so the other day, my buddy Brian, where our beehives are on his roof, he has a four-story row house. Uh, I have a three-story row house. And we needed to put a new roof hatch on because they're flat roofs. They're painted silver. It's a rubber roof. It's painted silver. And he had a beat-up wooden roof hatch, and it was leaking. So we bought one of these. It's called a bulkhead. It's a, it's a metal, has a metal curb with a door with little shock absorbers, kind of like your tailgate of your car. Is you this know? that monstrous thing you pulled up onto the roof? Yeah, that was fun. We'll talk about oh. that, too. <laughs> I'll talk about your stupidity later. So uh, um, we're, we're, I'm going to set the ropes and pulleys to haul this thing up the back of the building. And the bees are flying all over. And I said, I yelled at Brian. I said, you got to come up here and see this. And I'm like, they're swarming. You know, and sometimes bees do this thing called bearding because the hive is too hot or sometimes they're just orienteering, you know, orientation flights around. But this was um, kind of like a tor- an, in, a tornado, except it's full of bees. Yeah. Isn't that amazing to see? So, I, you know, I put on my bee gear. I, I just put on the, the jacket. I didn't put any gloves on. I don't wear gloves anymore with the bees. And and I just stood there and I pulled out my camera. I'm starting to shoot some video and Brian comes up and he's a novice with the bees and he's pretty freaked out. He's like, oh my gosh. I'm like, this, this is, they're not going to hurt you. So I just stood there in the, in the swarm, you know, and they're just swirling around the hive. They're about 20 feet up in the air and they come back down and the floor of the roof is covered with bees. 
and I'm being careful not to step on them. And I'm so engaged in shooting the video and still photos of this and narrating it. I'm like, oh, this would be a great video. And then I noticed the queen on the roof of the, on the floor of the roof. Does that make sense? Anyway, mm-hmm. she's yeah, crawling yeah. along the roof. And I'm like, oh, I should take a picture of that. And, I, and I'm like, and the other part of my brain is like, grab the queen. Grab the queen, Eric. Because wherever the queen goes, the swarm will follow. And they're waiting for the queen to fly off because they're going to go follow her. You know, that's why they're flying around like they are. And I put, instead, I got my camera on my phone. I'm taking pictures of the queen. And then I'm like, okay, now I'll grab her. And I go down to grab her and she takes off. <laughs> oh. So did, and, did she come back? No. Well, in yeah. a, well, yes and no. You don't know. Well, yeah. no, we can, it, in a way, yes. So um, I'm like, you stupid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're like in this, you know, things are kind of going in slow motion and I've got the uh, Moby or uh, Philip Glass music in my head. You know, I'm like, wow, this would be really good in a video. What kind of music would we use, you know? And instead, I just, oh, I'm like, oh, there's a queen. Let's take a picture of that, you know? And then I'm like, no, get the practical side of my brain is like, get the queen, grab the queen. You should always keep a queen cage in your pocket, by the way, of your uh, beekeeping gear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you can, if you have to, if you see the queen, you can pop her in there and then she's safe. So a little while later, you know, they're still swirling around and a bunch of bees start to collect on the front of the hive. And I'm like, well, well, what's going on now? And then I call Rick, (laughs) who is wedged behind his washer and dryer. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, I got a beekeeping question. She goes, well, I'm I'm working on my dryer right now. (laughs) I'm like, that doesn't matter. (laughs) What do I do? Because bees, the queen and and a cluster of a swarm... Well, it's called alighting, I think. They're going to go find a nearby tree branch and hang out there. And it looks like a giant pineapple. And scout bees are going to be looking for a suitable home while they wait there, right? Mm -hmm. So I forget that a four-story roof is above the tree line. Right. There's no tree limbs above the so high. So there's, there's nothing to go swarm on and hang on to for a little bit while right. everybody else is out looking around. So they swarm onto the front of the hive. And there, I sent you a picture of this, I think. And there's a picture yes, on, you did. on the website and in the video. I made a video about it. And I did. And I'm so busy photographing and videoing. And my friend Brian's kind of like, oh, this is I don't know about this. And I'm like, they're totally fine, you know. Well, they're not going to sting you. I know, you know, we're kind of, you're kind of screwed honey production wise. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that takes half your, um, half your, your workforce away. Yeah. And I did not realize until I called you, I'm like, could they be clustering? Could the swarm be clustering on the front of the hive? Right. And you're like, well, of course. And I'm like, there's the cluster. The queen's inside that. And I'm like, I, I need a hive box. Um, and we had a fully assembled hive which we're using as a bait box in the backyard of this house so i run all the way down the four flights of stairs i go out the basement i go unhook this thing it's connected to the fence you know and i get all the way back up because i'm just going to basically scoop all the bees into this thing into this pre-made hive it's all ready for them you know they'll be happy in there and they're gone (laughs) yes what i should have done you you, you lost the queen you lost the uh i lost the swarm There was, we had a bucket up on the roof with water and a two by four floating into it as backup feed water for them. Right. Even though it had been raining and raining. I should have just dumped out that bucket and scooped the bees into the bucket, you know, and then put them into the hive. So I, it was just these two huge mistakes. And I'm like, how long have I been doing this? You know? (laughs) It's hard to think in the moment what to do. That's the reason we offer uh, mentors to all our new beekeepers is, you know, when you're sticking, when you're elbow deep in 30,000 stinging uh, insects uh, or 60,000 stinging insects, it's hard to get your thoughts in order to do what needs to be done at the right moment. And I have lost hives like that. I actually had a... um, a swarm leave my hive and they were taking off and I could see it. And then just as I put my foot down, I saw this blue dot run underneath my foot. 
and it's because the queen's wings were clipped. She couldn't fly, but she could run along the ground trying to chase the rest of the swarm, and I stepped on her. Uh. <laughs> Oh, uh, so, so, uh, what did we learn, Eric? Um, I just need to be better at swarm control. <laughs> I, mm. I guess yeah. I, you know, it was, it was, and also it was what's called a new package. It was a, it was a hive that we had bought a package of bees for and poured them in maybe a month or month and a couple days. It wasn't, mm -hmm. a, it was a brand new hive, which almost never swarm. So I wasn't looking for swarm signs. I was basically trying to leave the hive alone and let them build up their strength. Right. And they built up really fast. Well, it's that time of year. You've had a, a, a nice uh, uh, kind of honey flow season up there. Yeah, the honey is flowing. The other hive, I just put another honey super on. And boy, those things are heavy when you have to move them. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed you can get them up and down uh, you know, from the roof like that. So uh, I did have to put a roof hatch up on the roof, and we got it up there. But what what was so wrong with that, Rick? <laughs> well, you were lifting it with straps, and you didn't pad the straps, and it was a heavy roof hatch. What, a couple hundred pounds? Yeah. And it actually started cutting through the straps, and you didn't realize this until you took it apart. And uh, you actually got it up on the roof, and you used to come along to hold it in place at different places. When I was growing up, we called those come alongs a calf puller. Huh. You, you, you use them when you, uh, uh, lots of times, uh, calves have trouble coming out, and you, you need to help them birth, and you pad their legs, and you, you actually pull them out with that because it's kind of tough. Um, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> more more information you wanted to know, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, it um, you you could have lost it uh, going off the edge. Of course, it wouldn't have killed anybody because there's nobody behind you. You were lifting it all in the backyard, but it sure would have uh, dented your very expensive um, uh, two hundred pound <laughs> roof hatch, bulkhead hatch. Yeah, I um, I was more focused on the pulley system, and my friend was rigging. The hatch and he's actually a former grip like me you know a, a you know movie and tv grip and so i deferred to his rigging and i didn't look at it too closely until because i was mainly on the roof mm -hmm. and when it got close to me i'm like oh i would have put the straps the other way you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rounded edges you know that kind of thing yeah because the sides yeah. of the hatch were rounded and the the bottom has a has a flange you know um so it sits flat on the roof and then you can tar it in and seal it in. And that flange was a little sharp. So, yeah, we, we had some a safety on there, but still it was uh, it was a little more dicey than I would have liked after the fact. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we've all done that. Um, it was fun to use like a double pulley system. It made it so much easier to pull a thing up on the roof. Um, it, it, it's just physics at work. And I, I love that kind of thing, don't you? And you almost want to get, you know like a set of four pulleys on top and four on the bottom and, yeah. and really make it easy. And, you know, of course, it takes a ton of rope to do that. Yeah, and I also found that the uh, the plastic nylon rope was much better than... Um, there's this inexpensive braided rope that they sell at the big stores. It's like $10 for 100 feet, and it's it comes in like camouflage color and a green color. And Yeah. But the plastic rope, which is a little more expensive... Um, I don't know if it's braided, but it's certainly stranded. Um, I found is stronger, but maybe there's some rope experts that are listening. It's the email, by the way, is radio at gardenfork.tv. But that was the roof hatch was fun to get up. Uh, in hindsight, I have a couple different ideas, but I'll probably never do that again. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, you you've done yours, and so now you've done your neighbors. There's not another roof hatch in the neighborhood to install. Yeah, you really can't pay me to do that. So, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I'm I, working on a flat roof like that. I have no idea how to make it waterproof. You know, it's rubber, 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 rubber and lots of lots of tar. And you, well, you, it's the rubber comes in four foot rolls, and then you use a, depending on what kind of roof it is, you can use a torch to melt the seams together or a cold. It's a cold sealing system that is a chemical seal. Mm -hmm. um, if your roof has wooden sheathing on it, you cannot use a torch in New York City. 
So, why, why do you think that is? Yeah, <laughs> the fire department got tired of responding to those calls. <laughs> So speaking of something that I could fix, um, Maddie, who's a longtime listener, sent me an email and he said, the pull cord in my push mower no longer has tension. It didn't pull out. In other words, the pull cord didn't pull out of the engine. It just lost tension. Do you have a video to fix that? I did a quick search and didn't see one. And uh, no, I don't. So but what do you think, Rick? Well, isn't that just a piece? I mean, you just replace the entire pull cord thing. You just... Isn't, yes. isn't that how it works? Well, you don't, it you don't replace on the... individual parts inside. I mean, unless the cord actually broke, then you can uh, rewind it. What's in there is a big, I think it's called a coil spring. It's like a clock spring. Right. Um, so wound right next to the pulley that has the cord on it is a long metal spring, a coiled spring. And when you pull the cord out, that spring builds up tension. And then when you let go of the engine pull it pulls the cord re basically winds the cord around the pulley again right and i'm pretty sure that that spring is broken and um, they break after a while a lot of engines you can buy the pull cord assembly and that has the pulley the cord and that spring and it looks kind of like a four or five fingered spider mount it just kind of bolts onto the top of the engine Right, um, but you can take it apart, and a lot of I would think you'd be able to order the spring. But actually, because I replaced the carburetor on my sister's generator, and I learned a lot about the ubiquity of one part fitting many different engines. So especially oh, yeah. carburetors for all, of all things. There's one carburetor that seems to fit many, many uh, ten to thirteen horse Briggs and Stratton engines. So it's interesting. Yeah, you know, um, I. Uh, I'm getting to the end of my life of my uh, my Toro mower. Uh, you can try to tell how it's going. And I have been seeing the ads for the uh, the rechargeable Go mower. And I remembered you uh, had a, did a trial on one of those, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. And it looks like they've improved it since then considerably. So I'm, uh, I may be in the market eventually to uh, do something like that. Well, we can't go without mentioning uh, Garden Fork's main sponsor, which is Troy Built. Um, oh, I stepped on their toes, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> and they actually have some uh, amazing battery technology coming out. Uh, I just met with them. And they have um, a electric motor system called the Core System. And I have mm -hmm. one of the string trimmers powered by that. I remember that, yeah. And it works really great. And in a... In about a week and a half, we're going to be doing a giveaway for a Troy built uh, core battery powered string trimmer. It's the one I own. It's about $240 retail cost. And we're going to be giving a doing a giveaway on Instagram with that. Okay. Wow. So you'll I so. think you'll have to follow me on Troy Built's Instagram feed for that or mine. But I'll promote it on both of them. So it just just search for Garden Fork on Instagram and I'll be posting some information about that. So, okay. Well. And I can't say on the record, but I would, I can't remember officially what their thing is, but you got to bet that they're Troy Belt's working on a battery powered mower. So, well then I, I have a little bit of life left in my old Toro. So, uh, but you know, if, if you can do battery powered stuff, why not? Um, almost I, everything yeah. in my garage now is battery powered my, uh, hedge trimmers, my, uh, string trimmer, um, you know, just everything you need to, um, to work around the yard. And it's so much easier than dragging a cord yeah. and a lot easier than trying to keep a uh, gas, little tiny gasoline engines, uh, uh, lubricated right. and serviced and everything. I'm, I would like to try the electric cars. I'd like to try the Chevy, Chevy Bolt or the Chevy Volt. They're, they're two different cars. One's all electric and one's a hybrid. Right. The challenge for me is living in New York during the week is plugging in charging the electric vehicle there are there's a charging station at our an ikea nearby and there's a charging station at the whole foods nearby but i does that mean i have to go to the whole foods and sit there for four hours to charge the car i don't know how long it takes to charge the car you know no, probably probably at 220 with the regular charger it's, it's going to be three or four hours to charge it if you're using um 110 it's uh, it's an overnight process. Interesting, because I would I would really 
you know, because we a lot of times we go up to the little weekend place and then I think about my carbon footprint of that trip. Um, and I'm like, you know, I'd like to because the electric cars have the range now to do it. I think the Chevy has a 240 mile range, maybe. Right. Um, so I could get there and I could charge it up. It's easy to charge it up there just in the garage, you know. Mm hmm. So I was curious about anyone that has an urban electric car. Uh, what are your options there? It's radio at gardenfork.tv. So. Now, of course, the other thing you need to consider is if there's a big difference in your range uh, during the winter or summer. Lots of times uh, I've noticed my uh, Prius uh, battery does not carry me nearly as far before the engine starts during the winter when it's cold. Oh, wow. So something to think about. But, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I read an article recently, uh, I think it's Netherlands, has the largest number of uh, electric cars in the world right now. Almost everybody is driving them. And when they need longer distance, they just rent a uh, uh, gas-powered vehicle. So, uh, and I, we've thought about that. You know, uh, we're just kind of mostly buzzing right around the couple hundred mile radius. Yep. And then when we um, do a big trip to Florida or something, you know, rent a car. Not a bad idea. Kind of the sharing economy on the on the on the gasoline car, right? Huh. <sighs> well, so, lots of activity on the Garden Fork discussion group lately. Yeah, on Facebook we have there's two Garden Fork things on Facebook. There's our official page which you can follow, um, but you you really can't post anything there and ask questions or anything. It's it's a, like a one to many relationship. It's me shotgunning information out to all, all everybody. But the Garden Fork discussion group is a closed Facebook group you have to ask to join. And we let it, almost everyone in except the spammers. Yeah, and, and that's, the reason it's a, that's the reason it's a closed group. We just yeah. want to make sure people aren't uh, spamming or, or just there to sell their stuff. Yeah. So they um, there, there are some really cool people posting neat stuff, huh? Yeah, uh, there was a woman, I, I approved her, and then almost immediately, her name's Lucy, uh, so welcome Lucy, and um, she had this, you know, several pictures of a very rocky, kind of dumpy looking uh, uh, plantings that she had tried along her fence, and she's not doing vegetable gardening, she's doing uh, flower gardening, but she wanted to know if there was anything we could do to help her, you know, how do you fix this, and she sure didn't want to be digging up all this rock. And uh, several of us kind of pitched in and made some suggestions about raised beds, sent her to the uh, Garden Fork site or the YouTube site. You get there either way uh, to see your uh, raised garden and particularly your lasagna gardening. Yeah, that's uh, worked out really well, actually. Yeah. And uh, and she was just thrilled. You know that she wouldn't have to dig down. Uh, we gave her some advice about how to rescue the plants that she had put in previously that were not thriving. And, uh, you know, had some Tips about, you know, you don't have to dig down, just cover it with newspaper or cover it with cardboard and then set your uh, garden on top of it. And she was just so thankful. So if you have questions like that, other people can help. Uh, the Garden Fork uh, discussion group is there to discuss all the different issues that people come up with. And uh, she was, you know, Lucy's first thing was don't judge. And we don't do that there because all of us have made plenty of mistakes uh, so if you have a problem with uh, gardening, beekeeping, DIY, or if you have suggestions, you want to show people what you've done, it's a good place to uh, come in and uh, demonstrate your uh, skills or to build skills. Yeah, Mike, uh, co-host Mike, posted about Switchel that he made. It's a drink. I didn't even know that. I, it looked like a, a recipe for a, a cough syrup or something. Did you get the little dig I made at you in the comments? Uh, yes, I did. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Switchel is a, it's a, uh, I don't know if it's a vinegar based drink, but it is uh vinegary. It's a probiotic. It, it has some, you know, healthful qualities. Um, it's very quenching though. It's very, it's, it's really nice to have in the summer after like a bike ride. Um, mm -hmm. There is a cup. There is at least one company in New York that makes Switchel and there's a, cafe called canteen on smith street court or smith in carroll gardens brooklyn and they have it on tap it's not cheap but uh, a glass of that over ice after a bike ride was quite nice 
It tastes wow. like a ginger ale, but soury, more sour. So kind of like a kombucha, a kombucha, 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 kombucha will come to Virginia beach soon. So, well, actually we have it. Um, it's, you know, it's in the health food stores and you can see it in the regular stores occasionally. And I've tried it and it's sour and it's supposed to be good pro- probiotics, uh, a little bit sour, a little bit sweet. Um, it's, it's interesting stuff. <laughs> Um, looping back to ornamental gardening, if you all want to check out a new YouTube channel, um, my friend Aaron, who is has the site The Impatient Gardener, has, yes. has started a YouTube channel with the same name. It's called The Impatient Gardener. So um, if you're into more ornamentals, and she's great at that. She knows all the names of the flowers, unlike me. Um, yeah. And so she's also on the, in the Facebook group and has a lot of good information. Um She's just she just knows so much about it. I'm kind of I'm always kind of like, oh, I didn't know that. You know? And, you know, in in truth, though, uh, plants are plants. And so when you you're looking at building gardens, the Facebook um, or your your YouTube uh, raised garden beds can be used either way. And that's what we told Lucy when she asked. I said, you know, you'll see this is all about vegetable gardening. But in the end, it's just a plant. And so it applies to everything. All right. So more or less. Well, we have let, we have time for one more thing. I wanted to talk about your uh, dryer duct project. Ah, the uh, dryer in our house, the duct. I had noticed it before, but I didn't realize what was happening. So this is the exhaust vent. The exhaust vent. It goes straight up, and a lot of them go through the roof. But these people that built this house were cheap, and it just went up and it stopped in the attic. And just so blew I went into up, the attic. Just blew into the attic. It was blowing wet, moist air onto the uh, underside of my roof. Great. The wood, the wood there, and I thought, Jesus, this is crazy. Of course, we've only been here 13 years, <laughs> so I, I'm finally just now getting around to fixing it. But in it, all this blue lint is laying around uh, where it, it pops out. Well, that's insulation. Plus, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> sort of. But I didn't like the idea, and you could actually see a dark spot on the uh, underside of the roof where it had changed color because of all the moisture. Interesting. Uh, there's, it's pumping a lot of uh, moisture straight up and shooting it up there. And that's not good for the underside of the roof. I didn't like having all that lint, free lint, just laying around. It could also Plus, become a, a mold problem in a different climate. So. It could be. Plus, the pipe that it was using was PVC. And when you run uh, air up PVC, uh, it it develops a static charge. And so when I got to reaching down inside this vent, cause it was a four inch, um, uh, pipe, you know, there was tons of lint stuck to the side of it. And that's a real fire hazard. Yep. Plus, plus it makes a chimney kind of effect that as it catches fire, it shoots straight up and it burns your roof off. And I thought probably it's not ideal. So I did some research online and it's an inside wall which is, makes it difficult to vent. So I managed to go laterally behind the washer out into the garage and turn the corner and go uh, 22 feet down to the wall, outside wall where the, the, the uh, door is on the side of the garage and put up two holes in there and found a, a um, blower, a vent blower that is designed for uh, dryer vents. Oh, and excellent. I put it, yeah, and I put it in the middle of it, of the uh, the run, and I also added a uh, a secondary um, uh, screen, lint screen, uh, on the outside, so we could uh, capture more of that lint. And the uh, blower actually has a sensor, and so it turns on when you're it senses the pressure from the dryer blowing out. It senses the pressure. And it uh, turns the blower on and it blows really good. And it has a, it passes the lint through what's, what's left, shoots it outside the house. Uh, I tilted it down just a little bit. So in case there's any condensation, because it is a very long run, uh, if there's any condensation in there, it will drip toward the outside of the house. And, uh, so far it's working like a champ, but it, it was a somewhat expensive project. It was fairly easy to do, although working with um, 
uh, that um, tin. tin tin steel uh, is its sharp edges and stuff. Uh, even with gloves, you manage to uh, somehow cut yourself up. So, um, but it works like a champ. I put a picture of it or a video, short video, on the uh, Garden Fork uh, uh, discussion group site, and you can take a look at it and see what I did. And uh, it's pretty self-evident how it works. But it, uh, if you have a problem, most problems are solvable. And I wouldn't even have known about this supplementary supplementary vent or a blower if it hadn't been for just doing a little research around the web. Yeah, I think code for dryer vents is eight or nine feet maximum unless it has a booster fan in it. So the good on you, because when you said 22 feet, I was like, uh-oh. Uh-oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, it, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, with PVC pipe and air moving through it, a lot of uh, wood shop vacuum systems, you know, to, you know, sawdust, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, to get the sawdust away from the sh saws and all that, they will run a ground wire, a bare copper wire through the interior of the whole system and ground it, ground it to a metal pipe in the shop somewhere. And that, I don't know if it eliminates the static charge, but that allows Reduces the static it, charge yeah. to go somewhere. Yeah. Wow. And it's great. You got that fan. Because it's kind of funny because I was at my sister's house and we, she says, you know, my bath towels are taking forever to dry. And I'm like, would you ever clean your dry wrench? She goes, I didn't know you had to clean it. So, <laughs> you know, he went to the store and bought a dryer vent cleaner and made a, a, a video. I hope the video turns out okay because we shot it with my iPad, um, which is an amazing camera, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the sort audio of. isn't great, but um, you can make you they, they sell these really cool camera rigs to shoot for iPod iPads. Oh, I didn't a, know that. Yeah, yeah, it just gives you a. It comes with a shotgun microphone that clips on. You can put lenses on the front. Um, it's called IO Photo. Is that the site? IO Photo. Maybe so. Um, is amazing for that. But anyway, um, they make different vent cleaning kits some are these semi-flexible rods that you screw to each other but i got one that is um kind of like a sewer snake with a big brush on the end and a handle on the other end it's about six foot eight foot long and that was much easier to use because a lot of people have 90 degree or 45 degree bends in their vent system so that was much easier for me because if I had the long poles, I would have never been able to clean out my sister's vent. But right. got a lot of lot of lint lint out of there, and that is quite the fire hazard, actually. So it is, and you know, it's amazing how much more efficient our dryer is now. Uh, you think about having to lift wet air, which is what it's doing, and yeah. shoot it straight up, and it was maybe fifteen foot up. That's that takes a lot of energy. When you shoot it out horizontally and then use this booster vent, it, we actually have a problem now that light items uh, like underwear or something actually stick to the back of the drum because the flow is so good going <laughs> through the. <laughs> so uh, one problem for another. This is a problem I'd be glad to have. Wow, that's great. Well, I, we just heard the gong there, so that must mean we're at the end of the show, right? Did I hit my... Um, Again, you know, let's talk about this last item real quick. Okay. And I just, I just want to let it go because we, we're always concerned about uh, security and electronic security, and and there have been so many breaches and whatnot. I have been trying the new Opera browser, probably the, one of the least popular browsers around right now. It is working out beautifully. It even has a built-in virtual private network VPN that you starts every time you start your browser. That means that you no one can intercept your information between you know you and wherever you're going and, and having it come back uh, and decrypt it so that you have a secure tunnel essentially every time you use your browser. So when you go into the bank, when you're working with your credit card information, if you're ordering things that are kind of sensitive or doing um, you know medical records work or whatever, it's on all the time. It's not a bad browser, and I have been really tempted now to dump uh, uh, Safari and uh, and uh, Chrome. Uh, it's a pretty good browser. By the way, uh, when it went to the uh, Garden Fork site, it said your um, your certificates were expired. So it checks those kind of things too. Yeah, I have to look into that. Um, I'm not quite sure 
what that's all about. Um, so it's something with my uh, provider, my host provider. Mm-hmm. I have to ask him. I've yeah. actually been using the Opera browser, and it works on YouTube, you know? Right. And it works on Facebook. Um, I used it to do a PayPal transaction, and they did a two-factor authentication of the purchase because it was they detected, I'm pretty sure, that it was going through a VPN. Right. Um, because when you go through the VPN, it, it doesn't give your local IP address. Am I correct? Right. Correct. So it didn't yeah. know. It knows. I mean, PayPal knows I log in from Brooklyn or from Connecticut. Right. And then when I logged in from this mystery VPN, which is based in Canada and owned by the Opera Browser group, um, it was a different thing. So they were like, let's just double check this. And I was happy yeah. to do that. So Sure. Uh, you know, two-factor authentication, VPNs. Uh, on the iOS device, there's a, um, a program called Safer VPN, which will, every time you um, fire up your uh, uh, browser or email, it will uh, automatically engage your uh, uh, VPN so you never have to think about it. Slows you down just a little bit, uh, but it sure has made a just a world of difference in security for us. Uh, we feel a lot better about the things we do online. Wow. That's great. Okay. Well, I need to, it's, um, it, we have had, we got an inch and a half of rain last night. We're almost seven inches over, uh, what we normally get this time of year. My tomatoes out, uh, out front are struggling. Uh, they need more heat and more dryness and a lot less wet lately. So, um, I'm going to go out there and, and give them a pep talk and see how they feel today. All right, cool. By the way, everyone, <laughs> I've been sending out a more concise uh, email newsletter every week, and you can sign up for that by going to our site. Uh, any page on the site has a sign up, but uh, or send an email to news at gardenfork.tv. And oh, yeah, the, the good up. that a little uh, little box floats up. Uh, with a good-looking guy in a cowboy hat, straw cowboy hat. I'm he, sorry if the pop-up comes up while you do it, but it's it's the only way that I can connect with people without having to go through YouTube or iTunes or Facebook. So it builds a community of like-minded people. So if it pops up, just say no thanks. And in a perfect world, it won't pop up again. That's, nah, it, it does all the time, but I don't mind. Because you like to see my face. I like to see your smiling face and your your straw (laughs) cowboy hat. And I can think of what what other smart-ass thing can I say about Rick? (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, I need to move on down the road, my friend. It's been great talking with you. All right, thanks for the time, and we'll see you all later. Bye. Garden Fork's theme music is licensed from uniquetracks.com. Music